Hey booktube, welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. Happy Saturday to you all out there in booktube land. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make a video since I I uh, was just talking books with a couple of my good friends on booktube. Uh, Christy Lewis at Dostoevsky in Space and Faith from Faith and Books. We were just wrapping up our read-along for um, our buddy read, I should say, of Notes from the Underground. Um which we read in um, February. It's still February, but we finished it. It's a short book, so just got off a wonderful a little Zoom call with the gals. And uh, before I run out for, to do errands, I thought I would make a video for you guys. Because surprise, I've got more books. Yes, these are some of the books I've picked up um, different times and places. I just, for different purposes, these are books I have bought, you uh, not used. These are new. These are all new books. But little things that have caught my fancy for one reason or another. And so I thought I would share with you my latest pickups at the History Shelf. Uh, let's start with this book, which kind of came on the heels of kind of resulted actually from a buddy read I did with Bill Rutenberg at the Rutenberg Library last year. We did a read along for um, covering World War One. It was a Max Hastings book, The Great C Catastrophe. And we were really intrigued by this guy in our reading. We wanted to learn more about him and we were curious about, you know, uh, what's the best biography. And uh, Bill found it and sent me a picture of it on Voxer. And I said, I'm going to pick it up. It was like nine dollars on Amazon, and at some point, some point this year, I think we're going to read it. Um, so maybe, maybe it could be for the fourth quarter of Historathon 2024. Who knows? But um, I picked up the Chief Douglas Haig and the British Army by Gary Sheffield. A little paperback here. Um, and there's a great picture on the back. Don't mind the glare if you can see it. So, Douglas Haig is the single most controversial general Britain has ever produced. At the end of the First World War, he was feted as the savior of his country, mourned on his death as a national hero. But within 10 years, his name had become a byword for military incompetence. In the most authoritative life of Haig yet, Gary Sheffield shows us a highly effective military commander who learned from his mistakes and whose contribution to winning the peace after the war has been unfairly overlooked. Written by one of Britain's leading military historians, it will reshape the way we think not only about Haig, <clears throat> but about the First World War itself. So, um, yeah, and then the blurb on the front from Andrew Roberts says that this is a uh, scholarly rehabilitation um, that should stand as the, like, be the standard biography of Haig. So definitely, I guess you'd call it a revisionist work in that it's revising decades and decades of historiography that have pretty much just labeled him incompetent, a butcher, heartless, cold. Um, so I'll be interesting to see if Sheffield can make the case and refute what I have read so much about Haig in the First World War, which, um, yeah, which was that he was basically incompetent and uh, did not care about sacrificing just tens and tens of thousands of men <clears throat> on the battlefield. So, yeah, at some point this year, I'm going to tackle this, hopefully with Bill. So I wanted to show you that book. This book has been in my cart, my Amazon cart, forever and a day now. We've got March of the Mammoths coming in um, uh, March, obviously. This book would be a candidate. I could start it, but I would not finish it in March. I could tell you that much, but it's been on my TBR forever, so I still haven't decided yet. Um, but anyway, I just decided to to go ahead and do it and pick up this book, and it's a classic. This is... Rebecca West, Black Lamb and Gray Falcon, A Journey Through Yugoslavia. Uh, introduction by Christopher Hitchens, but look at, look at this. Oh my God. It's like 1,100 pages. It's, it's, wow. It's huge. <laughs> I 
just to, the weight and heft of this book. Um, yeah, but I've been meaning to read it forever. Written on the brink of World War II, Rebecca West's classic examination of the history, people, and politics of Yugoslavia illuminates a region that has remained a focus of international concern since that country's dissolution. A magnificent blend of travel journal, cultural commentary, and historical insight, Black Lamb and Gray Falcon probes the troubled history of the Balkans and the uneasy relationships among its ethnic groups. The landscape and the people of Yugoslavia are brilliant brilliantly observed as West untangles the tensions that rule the country's history as well as its daily life. So I'm sure many of you have this book or know about it and maybe have even read it all the way through because that it is just huge. Uh, I first heard about this book back in my teens, maybe early 20s. I was going through a phase where I was reading just all of the women writers of the early um, 20th century uh, and Rebecca West featured quite a bit and I read biographies on her um, and obviously knew about this book from those biographies and how you know just seminal uh, a work it was and uh, it was a big deal for her and in her life um, so I just had to get it I couldn't take it anymore <laughs> I was tired of seeing it in my cart and I said I'm gonna get it so uh as far as the March of the Mammoths, you know, I do a lot of book review work, so it, I kind of have to be careful about what I commit to, and I'm already doing Historathon 2024, and I need to re finish reading my second book that I chose for quarter one, um, so I can finish up my wrap-up at the end of March for Q1 reading, and I also need to start thinking about my selections for quarter two, so I gotta get that going as well. Um... But yeah, I don't think anything I've got scheduled right now for reading in March is not over 800 pages, thank goodness. But I've already got my working board uh, mostly filled out for March as far as my reviews that are due. Um, sometimes I have to add to that list. Uh, those things pop up. But so far, nothing that hits the 800-page mark. Um, let's see. Oh. Oh. Okay, I'll save that one. Well, no. Oh, I can't make up my mind. <laughs> okay, big fan of this historian's work. Big fan of his podcast. As you know, I talk about it all the time. But this is his brand new book. And um, I think there was, it was marked down just very, very briefly on Amazon. And I just decided to pick it up. And this is Pax, War and Peace in Rome's Golden Age. By Tom Holland. The author of Dominion, a great book on Christianity, Christianity or the history of uh, history of Christianity uh, in the world. Um, so this, yeah, this one might actually be perfect for what uh, Faith at Faith and Books is doing. Well, they're reading all about Rome and Roman history. Um, but let's see here. This book. Got your color inserts. Let's see. The Pax Romana has long been revered as a golden age. At its peak, the Roman Empire stretched from Scotland to Arabia and contained perhaps a quarter of humanity. It was the wealthiest and most formidable state the world had yet seen. Beginning in 69 AD, a year that saw four Caesars in succession rule the empire, and ending some seven decades later with the death of Hadrian, Pax presents a dazzling history of Rome at the height of its power. From the gilded capital to realms beyond the frontier, historian Tom Holland portrays the Roman Empire in all its predatory glory. Vivid scene follows vivid scene. The destruction of Jerusalem and Pompeii, the building of the Colosseum and Hadrian's Wall, the conquests of Trajan, vividly sketching the lives of Romans, both ordinary and spectacular, from slaves to emperors, Holland demonstrates how Roman peace was the fruit of unprecedented military violence. Yes. This is the epic history of the Pax Romana. And Tom Holland really loves what he does. Um, if you've ever listened to the podcast, The Rest is History, he loves his Roman history. Um, boy, he can really speak to it intelligently, quickly, off the cuff. He's got anecdotes. He knows this time period. And uh, you can tell he really enjoys talking about it. He also has an interesting... Uh, uh, 
what I don't want to call it a love affair. It's not a love affair, but um, he really likes. He doesn't like Nero in the sense of you know. He just he he knows that he has an appreciation for what Nero in his younger days could have been, but then he turned into a monster. But um, yeah, I love hearing him talk about Nero. He's always uh, he always has some some really interesting quips about him. Um, okay, so now we're gonna switch over to I'm gonna move from ancient Rome to the Chinese Cultural Revolution. I picked up this book. I knew about it, and it was in the running for the the was it the Kundal, the race the, the recent history um, prize Kundal history prize. I think it won it. Right. Let's see here. I just moved my keyboard over so I could have more space on this desk. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Here. Yep. It was a winner of the 2023 Condole History Prize. So I was really tickled to see that uh, that it won. I was rooting for it. I was rooting for this book. Uh, and then it was not marked half down. Why would it? Why would it be marked half down when it just won the the history prize on Amazon? But I don't know. Maybe they wanted people to be able to, to uh, to purchase it. So I, that's what I did. So now I've got a, a copy of Red Memory: The Afterlives of China's China's Cultural Revolution by Tanya Brannigan. This was put up by Norton. Um, not too big of a book, but uh, boy, it. Uh, about 270 odd pages but it was enough to win the Kundal History Prize Award um, and it was her, it's her first book so congratulations to you Tanya Brannigan let's take a look here an indelible exploration of the invisible scar that runs through the heart of Chinese society and the souls of its citizens it is impossible to understand China today without understanding the Cultural Revolution, Tanya Brannigan writes. During this decade of Maoist fanaticism, between 1966 and 1976, children turned on parents, students condemned teachers, and as many as two million people died for their supposed political sins, while tens of millions were hounded, ostracized, and imprisoned. Yet in China, this brutal and turbulent period exists, for the most part, as an absence Official suppression and personal trauma have conspired in national amnesia. Red Memory uncovers 40 years of silence through the stories of individuals who lived through the madness, deftly exploring how this era defined a generation and continues to impact China today. Brannigan asks, what happens to a society when you can no longer trust those closest to you? What happens to the present when the past is buried, exploited, or redrawn? And how do you live with yourself when the worst is over? Um, so that's pretty profound. This is going to be a really... Oh, you know, just another sober read in the annals of reading about the effects of brainwashing and communism. And just, you know, this is that whole... It's just that whole rotten philosophy that has just... And it's just, it's not funny. I, I can only laugh because you'd cry, but it's just like why people bought into this stuff and allowed allowed themselves to be swept up in it. You know, it's just, it's horrifying. And I can't, I can't turn, I can't stop looking at it because it's just like, I just don't understand how people, I don't, I don't know how anyone can be attracted to this philosophy that was communism and uh which which bred such totalitarianist you know power uh, corruption propaganda brainwashing um and it's not just communism i mean there's obviously there's brainwashing and propaganda um in fascism as well so uh, but and i don't understand that either so that's why i say that i have a in my, in my, I have a, a major in like history and a minor in just totalitarianism and despots, you know, <laughs> I don't know, man. 
anyway, I'm really glad I picked this one up. Uh, I will start reading it at some point here soon. Um, so we're, we're kind of moving all over the place. This is just, there's no categories for all these different books that I picked up. This one is, well, okay. These are kind of faith related. I'll save those for last. Uh, I saw this book and, uh, it's a fiction, it's a, it's a novel. I consider it historical fiction, but it is, is also kind of follows on the heels of Red Memory. Um, it's called Lost in the Long March it's by Michael X. Wang. And it's about the the Cultural Revolution, I believe, or the, uh, well, the Long March. Let me see here. Now, this was China, 1934. Hang on. China, 1934. A naive orphan and shy gunsmith, Ping, has fallen in love with Yang, who is a sophisticated veteran, skilled sharpshooter, and true believer in Mao and the Marxist ideology. Winning Yang's affections will take an ideological battle, something Ping does not at first understand. As the Red Army begins its year-long tactical retreat, the Long March, Yang turns to Ping for comfort and companionship. Yang becomes pregnant, and soon their son is born. The army can't retreat with a crying infant, so they leave the child with a village woman <clears throat> and promise to return once the war is won. When World War II breaks out and Japanese soldiers arrive in the village, their now 12-year-old son enlists in the Japanese army to find his parents. Deeply moving and rendered in spare, muscular prose, Michael X. Wang's marvel of a debut novel, Lost in the Long March, drives toward a shocking reunion and resolution. Following the characters to the China of the 1970s and Mao's Communist Party as it has evolved, Wang tells a story that masterfully contrasts the intimate with the political, brilliantly revealing how the history of a country is always the story of its people, even though their stories can be the first to be lost. So, um, I just thought that this would be, I'm just, again, I'm just fascinated on the topic. Um, and you don't see a lot of historical fiction written about this time frame. Um, so I really wanted to check this out. And uh, also, I was really pleased to see that it was hugely marked down um, on Amazon. I don't know if it still is, but if you're interested, check it out. It might be. Um, Lost in the Long March by Michael X. Wang. This book I picked up, I know that I, well, actually, I have, I, I bought this when this first came out. But I don't know what happened to the, the original hardcover. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it. Um, came out in 2010. And then it came out with a new chapter as of 2011. But after the events of uh, October 7th, 2023, this book shot right back up to the bestseller list. And I saw this guy and all the speak. He was speaking at a bunch of different things. And talking about something he knows a lot about. And so I, de I definitely want to get to this um, this year, hopefully this summer, but it is Son of Hamas. Oh, sorry for the glare. A gripping account of terror, betrayal, political intrigue, and unthinkable choices by Mossab Hassan Youssef with Ron Bracken. Now, the Includes new chapter is not, I don't want to mislead you at all here. It doesn't talk about 2023 and what happened uh, in Israel, with the attack on Israel, it is rather um, a follow-up to some events in 2011. But uh, if you read this and you're intrigued about what Musab Hassan Yusuf has to say, you can find tons of videos <clears throat> of very recent uh, different talks he's given in interviews um, that you can watch. Um, but let me let me tell you a little bit about this. Let's see here. So he has since changed his name to Joseph Youssef, but it says he is the son of Sheikh Hassan Youssef, a founding leader of Hamas, internationally recognized as a terrorist organization and responsible for countless suicide bombings and other deadly attacks against Israel. An integral part of the movement, Mossab was imprisoned several times by the Israeli Internal Intelligence Service and ultimately embarked on a six-year spiritual quest that jeopardized Hamas endangered his family and threatened his life. Um, now, this is his memoir. 
um, is a shocking true story of a Hamas insider who rejected his violent destiny and is now risking everything to expose closely guarded secrets and how the world and show the world a way to peace. Um, so it's his inside look and his 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 story about what happened to him um, as the heir apparent to one of the founding leaders of Hamas. Uh, the guy is super brave and he speaks with a lot of passion. So um, if you want to know more, I suggest going with this book first and kind of you know, go out from there. But I picked this up. I just I just wanted to read it. And I, I didn't know where I put my hardcover copy. And plus, my hardcover doesn't have that new chapter. So yeah, that was reason enough for me. Um, oh, and uh, so this... I don't know if you guys know this, and I had a, a viewer say, can you do a video of all of your Library of America book, books? And I will do one of those. I've got to figure out. It's in a standalone bookshelf uh, in a recess um, between a couple of rooms, so I'm not sure how I can film it. I want to make sure the lighting's good. Martine thinks I should just take a shelf down at a time and then show the books on this channel. Not on this channel. I mean sitting here in this office space. But I've got to figure it out. But anyway, I got a new edition. I'm a subscriber and I get these slip bound cases um, once every eight weeks. Um, and so now I've got the complete set. The last one that came in for me was the Civil War, the first year, the final year. And this is the final volume of the four volume series. Uh, and this one begins with the controversial Kilpatrick Dahlgren raid on Richmond in March 1864 and ends with the proclamation of emancipation in Texas in June 1865. It collects 160 pieces by more than 100 participants and observers. Get to that. I like these slipcases. Um, I know if you buy these at a bookstore, they have the, the black cover with the red, white, and blue stripe and a picture of the something a writer sissy there's no obviously it's just but they're beautiful it's just cloth bound and you've got the ribbon and it's 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 great this one has the uh the map of the country and where things were um the paper is just it's so soft and it, it's acid free it'll never yellow um it does have some rep uh it does have some maps and stuff and some drawings, so that's cool. Um, but mostly you just kind of, they're just beautifully done books. Anyway, so this one, uh, this has a mix of writings from, you know, people like Lincoln, Sherman, Grant, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, Walt Whitman, Henry Adams, Herman Melville, um, as well as like soldiers and officers, if, you know. So I'm trying to slip that back in real quick. Again, I love the subscriber editions of these books. So, but stay tuned. I will have a, eventually I'll start doing like a library tour of my library of America books. It would never fit in one video. So maybe I might do a shelf at a time um, because I have a lot of them. So, and they always come with a nifty little fat info sheet. Um, so that's another one I picked up. Um, okay. So moving on to, uh, books of, re uh, relating to current events, cultural studies with, through a Christian lens. Um, I recently discovered this, uh, pastor, preacher, um, yeah person who kind of does different interviews and stuff but he's mostly a preacher I guess and uh I had I'd never heard of him before and his name is Vadi T. Bauckham Jr. Vadi Bauckham and uh so I wanted there's a couple of books that he had out and I'm, I'm trying to figure out which one came first so let me just check them real quick this one's 2004 I think this one's the latest one yeah so I picked up two of his books that I want to check out this is The Ever-Loving Truth, Can Faith Thrive in a Post-Christian Culture? Fully revised and updated by Vadi T. Bauckham, Jr. And here, here, is our, here is our pastor here. That's a great picture. Um, 
it says here, in this book, Vadi Bauckham addressed the cost of being a 21st century Christian and helped readers apply the unchanging truth of God's word to contemporary problems. Two decades later, those principles still stand, but the issues face, facing our nation and our world have grown exponentially more dire, particularly where sexuality, gender, faith, government coercion, and freedom, freedom of expression are concerned. Oh, sorry, you know what, I need, I need a drink of my tea. Mmm, that's better. In this fully updated version, Bauckham's strategies take on an even graver importance. Uh, the ever-loving truth draws parallels between committed Christians in our society and the New Testament writers Peter and John, followers of Christ who proclaimed and stood for truth in their non-Christian environment. Participants will find this compelling study leads them to evaluate what it means to be a Christian today and teaches them how to apply God's unchanging truth to a variety of circumstances. Um, I enjoy books like this that kind of speak to the current uh, zeitgeist and the, the atmosphere that uh, we find ourselves in, and especially as a Christian, uh, especially more so now than, say, 20 years ago, at least for me. Things are much more confusing and, frankly, just insane. <laughs> so, uh, Got to hang on to the ever-loving truth. You know what I'm saying? So I really want to, I want to read this real soon. Now, Body Bauckham, and I came out with this book in 2021, and I'm intrigued by it. And so I decided to grab this one as well. Um, and both of these books are from Salem Books, the publisher. Now this one they say is a national bestseller. This is Fault Lines. The social, social justice movement and evangelicalism's looming catastrophe. All right. All right. So this one is uh, does not shy away from controversy. It says here, the ground is moving. The death of George Floyd at the hands of police in the summer of 2020 shocked the nation. As riots rocked American cities, Christians affirmed from the pulpit and in social media that black lives matter and that racial justice, quote, is a gospel issue, end quote. But what if there is more to the social justice movement than those Christians understand? Even worse, what if they've been duped into preaching ideas that actually oppose the kingdom of God? In this powerful book, Vadi Bauckham, a preacher, professor, and cultural apologist, explains the sinister worldview behind the social justice movement and critical race theory, revealing how it already has infiltrated some seminaries, leading to internal denominational conflict, canceled careers, and lost livelihoods. Like a fault line, it threatens American culture in general, and the evangelical church in particular. Whether you're a lay person who has woken up in a strange new world and wonders how to engage sensitively and effectively in the conversation on race, or a pastor who is grappling with a polarized congregation, this book offers the clarity and understanding to either hold your ground or reclaim it. Um, yeah. So I, I am very intrigued by this. Um, you know, and it's, uh, it's written, you know, Vadi Bauckham. And I, I just really want to know what he has to say about it. We'll see. We'll see what's happening with this one. Um, in this book, I just picked up because I stumbled on a podcast. This is really obscure Lutheran pastor's podcast. And he was interviewing the author of this book who wrote it as a response to an older book that was written by another Lutheran pastor who basically saw what was coming uh, to the to the Lutheran church and I would it's it's more of a, a short um, the book that was uh, inspired this man to write this book it was about 200 page book and it was called Anatomy of an Explosion 
Missouri and Lutheran Perspective by Kurt E. Marquardt. So this book is called Anatomy of an Implosion. Okay. And it's by Gregory P. Schultz. Very intriguing cover. Anatomy of an Implosion. One pastor professor's diagnosis and lament at the mission drift to woke Marxism and Lutheran higher education. And you know, I read tons of things on Marxism and um, I, you know, immediately when I, I heard this subtitle, I was like, I got it. I got to read it. I got to read it. <laughs> um, and here's our author on the back. I think there was a three parts of that podcast that they had this, uh, Lutheran, um, pastor was interviewing Schultz. There was three parts to it. If I can remember, I'll link the first part below. And if you're intrigued, if you, if you, if you want to check it out, you can go from there. But, um, Let's see here. There's a bunch of different blurbs on the back. I'm trying to give you a concise overview here. Okay, so, okay, a bunch of these are blurbs. Okay, let's go. Anatomy of an Implosion, a book written in the far louder and more academic footsteps of Kurt Marquardt's 1977 book, Anatomy of an Explosion. That's what I told you is an adaptable blueprint for use in biblical, creedal Christian universities. Above all, this book is a call to arms for individuals of Christian consciences, parents, students, supporters, besieged, professors, pastors, and par parishioners, for the courage and biblical integrity to repulse the attacks of woke Marxism in their churches and schools with the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Um, hmm. Some of these blurbs, you know, make it sound really dire. Um, one of the quotes says, The truth that woke Marxists and their academic allies are, are suppressing is this. Oh, sorry, this is from the preamble of the book. Um, okay, so the truth that they're suppressing is this. Although it can be surrendered, language can never be destroyed. And that's from Matthew 24, 35. So, um, and then it says here, no less than the heart of the gospel is at stake. How so? Because the central teaching of scripture, how sinful man can get right with the holy God, namely the doctrine of universal justification, is the tip of the spear that brings every thought, every teaching, and every agenda captive to the word. And the word is capitalized. Christ Jesus, the Lord and Savior of the world. The woke Marxist agenda can never be squared with scripture. Um, yeah, this is a must read for anyone concerned about the state of higher Lutheran Christian or public education. Uh, so yeah, I was just really intrigued and I want to check it out wherever I, you know, Marxism just wants to, just, just tendrils are everywhere. Um. Let's see here. Book, oh, these are book recommendations in the front. I'm just trying to see if I can give you a little bit more meat in case you're interested. I don't know. You might have already turned off. Uh, okay. Well, um, anyway, I wanted to check it out. Not too big of a book. This is print, put out by Lutheran News Publishers. So, yeah, a wide variety of new book selections from the History Shelf uh, for your consideration. Um, all right, I've got to get going. I've got to go do some chores and take care of the pups, take care of the house, take care of some reading, and just try to enjoy my beautiful 64-degree day here in Colorado. So I hope wherever you are, you're enjoying yourself and you're having a restful and relaxing Saturday. But thanks for taking time to stop by here at the History Shelf and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.